cinematically brooding opening shot this time, and thoroughly unnecessary post-sundown grinding activity. More of that intermission later on. It's time to sort out the remaining large expanses of unprotected original gel coat, the underside of Alan. Although, I haven't glassed over the old drainage ports yet, or worked on the keel, so I'll leave those for now. I also have a special idea for the keel cooling system that I'll share at the end. But let's get back to the main expanses of old original gel coat. It isn't the first time I've gifted you gripping footage of sanding back resin, but it is the first time I'll share with you one of my myriad gripes. I can't find a brand of sanding discs that stay properly stuck to the sander plate. Makita ones fall off pretty quickly, and some non-brand ones last a little longer but lose abrasiveness fast. Any recommendations from you? You'll notice the fiberglass repair I did in episode 22, previously having sealed it with new epoxy primer as a small test area. I do also find that the sanding discs detach especially fast if the whole pad isn't pressed against the surface, so hand sanding the edges and contours seems less enraging. I'm including the propeller guard in this operation, although I'm yet to finalise the whole prop and rudder assembly plan. I've touched on this before, but the surface prep has given me an insight into Alan's original build. You can see the imprint of the woven fabric through the sanded gel coat. It's a good sign, as although all enclosed lifeboats need to pass stringent SOLAS requirements, there's still a lot of variation between premium ones, especially those marketed from Scandinavia, and other hulls that are quickly laid up with fiberglass chopper guns. It's quick, and fine for many applications, but woven composite layups perform much better under impact. Anyhow, it's about to be hidden forever beneath my next stage. Alan's finally ready to be primed, across the zone below the waterline. Well, nearly ready. I got an additional job done in the meantime, one of the list of improvements highlighted by Alan's sea trials. Old steel fittings are bolted to bow and stern, and their reliability, right there asking to bash holes in other boats whilst offering up nothing of any use. So I got going on their removal. It didn't take all night, despite the dishonest editing cut here, but the pub was beckoning. Getting the spigot off was at an awkward angle for the cutoff disc, and I risked breaking the brittle disc if I banged up against the perpendicular steel. Eventually, and having realised how damn hot steel gets when you friction cut it, it was off, and I tidied up the sharpness with a flat wheel. I could have unbolted, unbedded, and removed the whole thing, but it's a solid central mount for things in the future. The two-part epoxy primer needed a good stir once again to recombine the resin and the pigment, thanks to a viewer for the tip to get excess paint off the stirrer. Switching the drill onto hypersonic superfast mode did the job fine. This is also a reminder to make sure you're careful as you near the end of two cans of two-pack paint. There's always wastage as you measure out paint, and of course it might mean one runs out just before the other. There's a risk, unless you have more ready and waiting, that you end up slightly short of resin or hardener, and then having to throw away the whole lot if already part mixed. Epoxy is unforgiving with mixing ratios. I'm using acetone to thin the paint, but I think I'm going to go back to xylene, like I use with the polyurethane paint. The acetone makes my foam rollers swell up, even though marketed as being solvent safe. I then proceeded to roll the epoxy primer onto the gel coat, which is a critically important step if you want the painting to be successful. I'm leaving the keel and a few other spots bare for now as I mentioned, as there's work there to be done. Another good question is why black? There are a few answers. Firstly, I don't want the eventual coating to be black, as it's hard to differentiate things visually when everything's black, and you need the primer and top coat to be different colours so you know where you've been. I do however want it to be darkish, so using white or light grey would have been less useful. Also, it was cheaper than more exotic colours. My initial thinning left the opacity a little transparent for what is a high build primer, so I corrected it a second time round. It's only £12 a litre after all. The manufacturers give detailed instructions about the number of coats and the film thickness, which is all very well if you're using professional spray gear, but I'm working just based on getting a couple of coats of decent thickness. So this is what Alan's lower half will look like for a good while now. I'm not ready to do the build work around the keel or cooling pipes yet, and the boat won't be lifted for a couple of months, so the bare spots around the cradle rest will have to wait too. Is the surface cosmetically good? Not really, but I was rollering quickly and it's not the top coat. Function over form once again. Well, that's what I tell myself. 
I've not cut off the front spigot yet since the wooden storage trunk's in the way and the sparks would have set fire to it, but I will later on. A few addendums for you. When I bought Alan the boat over two years ago now, Alan the human being, his namesake and our Scottish lifeboat dealer, chalked this note into the gel coat. It referenced the expedition I ran and the launch destination. I've decided to keep this, and so mastered out when painting, and I'm building up a few layers of gloss polyurethane spray coating over the top. Also, this has turned up in the boatyard. I'm keeping the clips abstract out of respect for the privacy of the owner, but you can see this fine pair of lee boards. Essentially, they are retractable keels to aid stability when deployed. Alan won't be embellished with the pair, sorry for that, but interesting to point out nonetheless. Finally, I think I've had an idea to kill two birds with one stone. I've already said that I'm going to build up the hull to protect the propeller shaft housing and plonk more steel ballast within it to help lower the centre of gravity. I'm also keen to protect the existing, or perhaps a new, keel cooling apparatus. So, I'm wondering about running the cooling pipes within this upcoming ballast structure, with plenty of space for seawater to pass over the cooler and allow heat to escape into the water. It means no need to build a cage over the pipes to protect them from ice. I ask this hesitantly, but what are your thoughts? That's it for now, you lot. Bye.